Today I would like to share with you some of the uh, work we're do doing at Argonne National Lab in trying to develop the next generation lithium ion for plug-in hybrid and electric vehicle because that's the mission of uh, Argonne for the Department of Energy. I'd like to acknowledge my co-worker, Abu Imran is Moroccan. Of course, you know this gentleman, sitting right there, Elias, who worked at Argonne until this year, or last year. He last year, yeah. And now he's a uh, uh, director at the Qatar Foundation. Of course, we have other people, including Jan Kuksan, who's my collaborator and others. And of course, I would like to acknowledge the folks at the Vehicle Technology Program at the U.S. Department of Energy who fund this work. Now, i like to start with this busy slide. This is the 2009 Global Human Activity Energy Flow. What it says is that uh, pretty much all application from non-transportation to residential, commercial, industrial, rely on many sources of energy, from hydro all the way to oil. But only one application, which is transportation, rely on one source. But the story doesn't end up there because half of the energy is rejected as heat. So not only we are relying on one source, but we basically waste half of it. So the situation obviously is unsustainable. Now in the China and India and all that are coming big time. As a matter of fact, China is now the largest producer of vehicle uh, in the world. So we have to do something about this. This is also, uh, from the US standpoint of view, the United States consume about 19.1 million barrels per day. Um, so at the end of dollar a barrel, we're talking about $2 billion that is spent every day on oil. And 72% of that is for transportation. So if you want to make an impact on reducing our reliance on oil, we have to make an impact on electrification, obviously. And then there is something that concerns everybody, which is the uh, greenhouse gas emission. So if you stay business as usual, um, you can see within 100 years, the atmospheric CO2 concentration will go to almost 700 ppm. And that translates in an increase in the Earth temperature by 4 degrees C. So it took almost 200 years to increase the temperature by 1 degree. Now we're going to have some serious problem. We already have some climate change happening now. But at this point, the situation can be unpredictable. Of course, if we change course and expand, at least try to expand electrification, we can stabilize that number to 450, which is the one that we, all the countries agreed on and, uh, for the Kyoto Protocol, for instance. Fortunately, electrification is underway, thanks to Toyota and the Prius, um, which uh, has worked extensively on developing the hybrid electric vehicle. Uh, in this case, of course, you still use a convention engine, but uh, you have a battery. Uh, that uh, uh, assist main engine and recover energy during the regenerative braking, for example. So that's why you never charge its battery. Uh, the fact that the battery is very small allow for the cost to be much moderate and therefore the expansion of the Prius, for example, and others. The one that the United States is more interested to is this one, is the plug-in, and more specifically the plug-in 40 miles, which is about 70 kilometer electric drive range, because 78% of the commuter in the United States commute within 40 miles. So you can imagine, you can go to work and come back all electric. So the, uh, you basically can go to the gas station three or four times a year. In this case, you have still the internal convention engine, but you have a large battery because you have to drive the vehicle all electric. Uh, so, and then you still have uh, transmission and all that. So we can see there is tremendous amount of uh, technology that is incorporated in very limited volume. And because of that, you really have to increase significantly the energy of the, chemi uh, the chemistry of the, uh, of the battery, energy density of the chemistry of the battery to allow for making the battery very compact. And, and this way you can reduce the cost. Uh, the last, which is our ultimate goal, is all electric. Um, of course, um, the biggest challenge here is the range. Uh, all the technologies so far has limited range, uh, 160 miles. 200 miles is the maximum at the moment. In this case, you don't have to worry about gasoline. Now, as it stands, these technologies here use the nickel metal hydride batteries, uh, which are uh, very good power, but uh, they do have limited energy. And that's why lithium ion is very attractive, because it provides high volumetric and gravimetric energy density, 
In another word, you can make them lighter and smaller, but yet energetic and powerful. Uh, the other advantage of lithium ion, and that's why a lot of people has been working on it for many, many years. You, you see this square is very large, which means we have, it's very versatile. You have different cathode to select from, different anode, different electrolyte, high voltage, low voltage. So it's very, very versatile comparing to the conventional technologies which are concentrated on one, one system. The applications are very broad, <laughs> of course, uh, consumer electronics uh, basically is completely dominated by lithium ion. Uh, this business is about uh, 20 billion dollars now. Um, and uh, of course the main and the, the future business is in uh, either automotive or in grid, which are the topics of this uh, conference. Uh, these are order of magnitude largest businesses because the batteries are much, much larger. The technology as it stands now rely on uh, layered oxide and they heard about this from uh, several speakers, either a layered or a spinel or a olivine uh, based, and mostly graphite as the anode. But you look at these technologies are very limited in capacity, so you can't achieve the, the range or the cost uh, needed if you use this, obviously you can use large battery. So we really need to do something about increasing the energy. This is an example that is used in a CV bolt they use a mix of NMC and spinel, you can see, to, to get the range of 40 miles, all electric for plug-in, you need this very large battery. So you can imagine the cost. This is basically is the whole chassis of the vehicle. So we're talking about maybe fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, which is the cost of a vehicle. So the bottom line to, uh, and the vehicle costs about $40,000, $47,000. This is a compact car. So we really need to increase the energy and by increasing the energy, you can make an impact on cost. I'm going to explain that to you. This is a pack that is used by uh, uh, Ford in their first generation electric vehicle. It has about 23 kilowatt hour uh, energy density, uh, 500 pounds, which is about 270 kilogram, and 125 liters. So this is today's technology. If you really want to impact the cost, uh, you really have to increase the energy density of the chemistry. So if you double or triple the energy density of the chemistry, you can still make the same energy density at the pack level, but the battery is much smaller, which means you reduce the cost across the board. So all your materials will be lower in, uh, in volume and, and, and weight. And that's how you really make an impact. Because a lot of people change cathode, cobalt base to manganese base. The impact on that change at the cathode level is only 8%. So your margin is very small. This is a way to reduce the energy. And how can you do that? You can increase the energy by increasing the anode energy. We heard the, the speaker now talk about uh, some interesting work on the silicon. Uh, at the moment, we are at uh, graphite. There is a needle missing here. 350 milliamp hour per gram. We are mostly looking at 600 to 1,000. Very practical because there is no cathode that can match. 2,000 or 3,000 milliamp hour per gram. Sorry about that, but that's the, the reality. The reason is there is no coating technology that can give you very thick electrode at the speed of today. Yeah. So if you can achieve 1,000, that's three times almost. And if you can uh, um, develop a cathode material that has higher capacity than today's, our target is about 300 milliamp hour per gram. Then by coupling these two systems, we can easily double the energy density of the lithium ion. And that's the, you can do that also by increasing the voltage. As it stands, there are cathode material like the NCA. When you go higher in voltage, you can get much higher capacity. You can get 250 to 260 milliamp hour per gram. The problem, they are very unstable. So these are the strategies. So what I'd like to say today, we'll show you an example on the anode, an example on the cathode, and an example on the electrolyte uh, within these 20 minutes or whatever left. So if you think, for example, the layered oxide, uh, the NCA, which is used now in a hybrid electric vehicle for power application, or the NMC, and if you charge at 4.1 volt, that's where the operating uh, voltage of this material because of their stability, you get about 140 milliamp hour per But if you go higher in voltage, you can achieve much higher capacity, which we are targeting. Uh, the problem is that high voltage, these material decompose. And here is an example. For example, you go to 4.5 volt, 
you can achieve almost 230 milliampere per gram with the existing technology, which is the NCA. But if you cycle it, you can see it goes down very quickly. So the reason why it goes down very quickly, if we, for example, take one particle here and microtome it in half after cycling, this is where you get. This is a high resolution transmission electron microscope. You can see the layers of the NCA, the, the structure. And then you have, uh, see it from the electron diffraction, is a layer type. You have another phase that is formed, which is a nickel oxide base, and you have a surface film. Uh, and the nickel oxide phase is basically very insulating to lithium, um, and that's the reason why you get a very high impedance, interfacial impedance. Uh, what happens is when you charge lithium, uh, nickel, NCA, or nickel cobalt aluminium in this case, when you remove lithium, nickel oxide or nickel cobalt oxide thermodynamically is unstable. NiO2 does not exist. You have an immediate reduction and release of oxygen, so you end up with this phase here, and the oxygen react to the electrolyte give you another film. So therefore, the interfacial impedance where lithium moves through that, that interface become much more difficult. And so therefore, Having nickel rich is attractive because it gives us high energy, but it's a problematic because it reacts, um, especially when you go higher in oxidation states. So the first step could, could be, for example, you can use a core which is nickel rich, and then as we know, manganese is much more stable. It's, uh, it can be stable in manganese 3, 4 plus. You can put in a shell on the top of that, so you end up with a core shell like this. So you take advantage of the nickel rich for high capacity, and manganese rich at the shell for stability. And uh, here is an example where you can make a material where co-precipitation is uh, straightforward, which is mass scale at the moment. In this case, we're using a hydroxide. A hydroxide. So you co-precipitate for a nickel rich hydroxide, and at one point then you switch and you use a manganese rich, so you end up with this type of composition on top. And once you do the calcination, you have a core shell material. And, uh, so our concept seems to work. Core alone, capacity drop. When you start adding manganese at the surface, depending on the concentration, you stabilize the system because you have less nickel at the surface that create surface reactivity. The problem is that you have two materials, one on the top of the other, that they swell at different rate. One at 9%, one at 2%. So obviously you expect at one point you have a kind of uh, separation between the two. And once you have that, the lithium will not be able to move through that and the capacity drop. Mm -hmm. And that leads us to the first concept, which is a core share with gradient. Um, so basically what you do, you have a nickel rich here to give us capacity. At this point, you start reducing the nickel and increasing the manganese, you see? And cobalt if you want. So you end up with a core share with gradient. So, and you can see by Moving by making this material, you get much better stability at high voltage and high capacities. The problem is, as you can see here, the shell is very small. So the concentration of manganese is very small at the surface. So we're talking about 15 years calendar life. Um, here I'm showing only 50 cycle. So clearly we need to increase the manganese ratio at the interface, at the outer layer of the, of the material. To do that, we change the concept and we talk about what we call a full gradient material. Uh, basically what you do is start higher in nickel at the bulk and you drop it and increase the manganese so now you have very high surface manganese rich that can give you very good stability. Blue it means stable, again surface reactivity with the electrolyte and also improved safety. You can do many scenarios, this is in the first one which you have full gradient, you can also to enhance the stability across the particle, you can keep your manganese stable across the particle and reduce the nickel and increase the cobalt frame. So you have many, many scenarios. So Argan has a pattern on this since 2013. And the way of doing it is very simple. Um, this is the uh, co-precipitation. Uh, most of the material, uh, the companies that make nickel, the NMC for example, they use this process up to now here. So you have a nickel cobalt manganese concentration that is stable put it in the reactor, you add chelating agent and co-precipitation agent like uh, um, <coughs> sodium hydroxide, for example, um, and then you form a, a, a spherical material. What you do in this case, you add another tank that is manganese rich. You start with nickel rich and immediately start diluting the, the nickel with the manganese, so you end up changing the composition where the particle is growing.
This is an example uh, because we are using nicorice in this case 60%. The density of the uh, precursor is very high, it's about 2.2. Once you do the calcination, you get very, very high density. It's very important because a lot of people talk about high capacity material but nano. It doesn't make any sense because the key word, of course, is capacity, voltage, but also how much you put, how much loading in the electrode is very critical. So in this case, you can see it's very large. and. Uh, this is uh, the SEM and APMA um, of, the, of this uh, material before during the hydroxide process and after. So the material doesn't change morphology. So once you form the spherical particle at the hydroxide, you calcine them. You may end up with some uh, interdiffusion of the metals, but you see clearly that the gradient is maintained in this case. Uh, if you look a little deeper by uh, high resolution transmission channel microscopy, we also find, comparing to most of the NMC or NCA, we have actually rods instead of particles, nanoparticles um, that form a secondary particle. This is a primary particle, so when you do the APMA on this nano rod, you can see that the concentration is changing as well. So not only at the secondary particle, but also at the primary particle. And if you dig deeper, uh, you can see clearly that the uh, the orientation, uh, there is a, a clusteric alignment on the, uh, of, the, uh, of the particle, for example. So here is the center and this is outside. So in full, instead of having a little moving through the grain boundaries, it can move actually straight forward because you have a path where uh, the, the, uh, the layered structure is in the radial direction of, of, the, uh, of those uh, rods. And uh, here is some uh, examples where we operate here at 4.3 volt. Um, but I will show you this, it's much more interesting. This is a full cell, we have an additive to protect the carbon since we are operating at high temperature. So you can get a thousand cycle with the nickel rich, which is very, very impressive because uh, with NCA at these high voltages, 4.5 volt or 4.3 volt in this case, um, it's, it's impossible to get 100 cycle. It's just impossible. And the gradient. Uh, structure does not change after a thousand cycles, both at room temperature and high temperature. Of course, in this case, we have to protect the carbon, so we use an additive that polymerizes when you do the initial formation and form a passivation film that is very stable. On safety-wise, since we increase the concentration of manganese at the surface, this is a differential scanning calorimetry. I was telling that lady, this is what you need to do uh, for safety. Uh, what you do is you charge your, your electrode and add electrolyte and heat it up uh, slowly. And you can see clearly the onset temperature of the NCA is very low, which means the activation energy is low, reactivity is fast, and the overall heat, which is proportional, fortunately I didn't put it here, uh, to the surface area of this peak is very high, comparing to the gradient, which has much higher onset temperature, because, again, it takes time more heat to create reactivity and the overall reactivity is very low. So not only we improve the cycleability significantly, but we also can improve the safety. And I think I have videos. I hope they can work. This is the NCA. Ah, I think it will work. The, we did the nail penetration. So what happened? And Nick Rich is very, very unsafe. It's just because of the surface reactivity, because of the release of oxygen that reacts with the electrolyte. And that reactivity is very exothermic. You do it with the gradient material. I'm not sure you can see it. Yeah. Uh, it's a nail coming in. Nothing happened. And this is the profile of the temperature once you short your cell. You see the temperature went to only 75 degrees C. In this case, it's only 500 degrees C, for instance. Now, since we are operating at high voltage to get those high capacities, we have to look for high voltage electrolyte. I'm going to share with you uh, one example of high voltage electrolyte that we developed. Uh, if you take a conventional electrolyte, a carbonate-based electrolyte, and operate at high voltage using this high capacity cathode, high voltage cathode, you can see that the capacity drops very quickly depending on the voltage you use. And the efficiency is very, very low. I think the best example is using a floating test. You take this cell and float it at certain voltage and look for leakage current. And you can see that, uh, of course, leakage current means decomposition of electrolyte. So at high voltage, you have a high leakage current, as you can see here. So clearly, conventional electrolyte in the long run might not work with high voltage at, uh, uh, under high voltage operation.
So we've been looking at uh, different fluorinated based solvents as potential uh, solvent for high voltage electrolyte. So we have uh, all kinds of fluorinated solvent, either ethers based or alkyl based or uh, cyclic and linear based or even sulfone based. And uh, as uh, Emilio mentioned, we do have a supercomputer that do a lot of uh, DFT calculation. In this case, uh, my colleague Larry has done some calculation that shows that this fluorinated solvent has very high tolerance to high voltage for us. So the problem with this solvent is they are very bulky. So obviously the viscosity of the electrolyte become low and that translates in lower conductivity. So if you use fully fluorinated, we are at about 210 minus 3, which is good maybe for electric vehicle because the rate capability is very low. It's not very good for, uh, let's see, hybrid, where the power is much more important. So we looked at these type of fully fluorinated and also partially fluorinated. So if you do a, a kind of uh, a floating test, you can see that the leakage current that is basically reflecting the decomposition of the electrolyte happened at 5.3. So basically in this area, okay. And here's an example where you use a high voltage cathode, like this one with the LTU. With, that, with the conventional electrolyte, you lose all your capacity after 400 cycle. With the fluorinated electrolyte, you have still 70% of your capacity. So they are much, much more stable. And we do have, how much time? Huh? Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. So here is basically a flame test that shows that this type of electrolyte is non-flammable. So you can take your oil on it, but I know why it didn't work. And we did also look at partially fluorinated, and they also work very well. Um, we see both at room temperature and high temperature. We see the non-fluorinated one, is capacity drop very quick. The, fully, the partially fluorinated also shows very good promise. In this case, you can use them with high power because they do have high conductivity. Now the last part is, uh, I'm going to skip this because the lady has already explained it. Uh, you know, most of the metal or metal oxide tend to alloy with lithium and you can end up with significant capacities. Um, for example, all these that are indicated in green can alloy. Uh, the one of interest is the tin and silicon, just because the cost of silicon is very low and the capacities are very high in this case. Uh, unfortunately, even though we have capacities, the expansion are very significant. We're talking about 380%. And you can imagine, I think I have videos, I think I'd like to show videos to the student. If you take, for example, a, a, a nanowire, like uh, it's being presented, and run litiation in a TM, this is a colleague of mine that uh, did it from PNNL, this is what happened. Things disintegrate right away. So. Um, and if you do it in a real electrode for lithium ion, where you basically make silicon mixed with carbon and make electrodes and run it, you have to be patient. Look at this dot, we're not litigating because this is more of like, a, I know what it is, but uh, <coughs> once you start having the dot here, start alloying lithium, please pay attention to this. This one is the reference electrode, this one is a cycle, it's using AFM for instance. So pay attention here, you can see that there is cracking that start forming. Can you see that? Yeah. So this is the first cycle. So obviously this is not possible. The, the, the concern is after several cycles, some of these particles will be totally isolated. And therefore there is no current moving and they become completely inactive. So. Uh, at Argon, we're looking at ways of uh, keeping the conductivity in to prevent isolation. And here is an, a way which is very interesting. We develop a process which is based on a byproduct of the semiconductor business. So basically, it's uh, mass produced because folks has it there. They don't know what to do with it. Um, so what you do basically is to incorporate silicon between graphene sheet. sheet. And graphene, uh, graf uh, graphene, sorry is very flexible. So you're not doing it like in carbon where you're intercalating to using an uh, electron transfer. It's basically just uh, accommodating nanoparticulate of 20 to 30 nanometer between graphene sheet. And the idea is the particles are small, so it takes a long time to crack. Once they crack, they will collapse, the graphene sheet will collapse on them and then keep conductivity. That's the role of the, the sheet. But they also can play, act, can act as active. So you can see here, for instance, there is plenty of nanoparticles in the sheet, 
Um, this is the initial charge and discharge. It shows very good promise. We have almost 86% uh, efficiency, which means the, the irreversible loss is only 15% or 14%. And this is an example where we cycled versus lithium. Uh, you get sustainable capacity after 100 cycle. Uh, and if you reduce the concentration of uh, silicon between the graphite sheet, you can get 600, 500 million power per gram. Keep in mind that silicon has higher density than carbon, so that basically double the capacity of the electrode, carbon electrode. We can get very good. These are very high loading. We're talking about 4.6 uh, milligram per cc, per square centimeter. Very high loading. And you get very good cycle, maybe almost 250 cycle at 1C rate without any capacity. So this is a very promising. And as I mentioned, I looked at the semiconductor. They do have big reactors where the, the gas is inside. You just throw in graphene and then heat it up at 70 degrees C or so. And you can end up with a, a material that is valuable for the mine. With that, I would like to conclude. Of course, to enable future electrification of vehicle, there is a need of developing uh, very high energy battery system. I show you an example. We do have other example. The composite lithium rich, which is uh, invented at Argonne, is one another candidate. Uh, I show you today the nickel rich full grade and material. Uh, one example of uh, fluorinated. We do have another example based on silane, which is uh, also non-flammable, but I didn't have time to show it. And I show you graphene silicon. We do have a composite silicon, carbon, cobalt, uh, and uh, tin. Uh, they didn't have a chance to show, but maybe next time. But this looks very promising, and in all cases, all these materials are scalable, which is very key. With that, thank you very much.